Have you ever had difficulty finding a job? I think our speaker yesterday morning at the men's breakfast, by the way, that about 20 men yesterday morning, tremendous breakfast, tremendous speaker, uh, awesome message. Uh, but our speaker yesterday morning had been looking for a job for 19 months, I believe, and just this past week got a job. But he kept his faith strong. He prayed with his family, believed God, and God just kept continuing to meet a need. A difficult job. I've had a difficult time in years past. Many of us have. And while you're looking for a job, you hear about a good job. Have you ever heard of a good job and didn't get it? You ever heard of a good job and wished you'd gotten it? How many of you going to be honest this morning and raise your hand? Okay, I just want to make sure here. But while you're looking for a good job and you hear about a good job, then someone comes and says to you, it all depends on who you know. You have to know somebody before you'll ever get hired there. Well, that could discourage your faith. Amen? So if you don't know anybody, you might as well forget it. It all depends on who you know. Do you think it might be said better this way? It depends on who knows you. Amen? On who knows you? Who knows me? I like the scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 in the King James Version. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author, the beginner, and the finisher or completer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is the author or the beginning of our faith? Don't you know today that He gives the first incentive for our belief in Him? It's because of Jesus pursuing you. See, he, how many of you know He knows you? He knows you. He knows me. He knows us. Did you know that Jesus has been pursuing you? But Brother Bracken, now I know Him. I've received Him as Savior. I'm, but you know He's still right there and He's always pursuing you to draw you closer to Him. He's pursuing you. He's been pursuing us, each and every one of us. And this story this morning in the Bible is about the widow and the prophet Elijah. And it's about the care and concern that God has for people. God doesn't just care about me as a Christian or as a pastor. God cares for people. He cares for the unsaved and the lost that don't know Him. He cares for the redeemed, the saved that do know Him. He cares for people. God's care for the man of God and for the widow and her son is the reason the unusual, uh, for the unusual miraculous provision that we read about today. Because God cares, that's why I'm healed today and no longer walk on crutches. Some of us said here but with cancers gone because God has healed us and He did it because He cares. He loves you. He loves me. He cares about everything that happens in your life. He cares about your frustrations. He cares about the hurt. He cares about the joys. He cares about everything about you, good or bad. He cares. That's what God's all about. He cares for people. He cares for people. He cares for you. God cares. There's an old southern gospel song that I've always liked, and I want to read the lyrics to you today. I can't take a heart that's broken, make it over again, but I know a man who can. I can't take a soul that's sin sick and wash it white as snow, but I know a man who can. Hallelujah. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you think that no one loves you and your life is out of hand, I know a man who can. Hallelujah. I can't walk upon the water and I can't come a raging sea, but I know a man who can. I can't cause blinded eyes to be opened or the lame to walk again. Oh, but I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you think that no one loves you and your life is out of hand, I know a man who can. Is there anybody in the house today that knows a man who can? And his name is Jesus. Doesn't matter the situation, doesn't matter the circumstances. I know a man who can. He, who can. 
Number one, this morning, our lack makes room for God's abundance. Our lack makes room for God's abundance. You remember verse 7 we read a few moments ago? It said, sometime later the brook dried up. Have you ever had the brook dry up? <laughs> and then in verse 12, listen to verse 12 again at first. Uh, Kings chapter 17 and verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat and die. Whew. That's an awful goal to have, isn't it? To know that you're going to die. Elijah had prophesied under the anointing of God that there would be no dew and no rain for three and a half years. And a severe drought followed his prophecy. People were starving, no crops, no water. After he gave such a terrible prophecy, God told him to go and hide. You know why he told him to go and hide? Because the king and the people thought the drought was his fault and they wanted to find Elijah. Let's get rid of the prophet and the rain will come back. Let's get rid of the man that prophesied this and the crops will grow again. Now I want you to look with me this morning. 1 Kings 17 and 1. Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you. Talk about room service. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now he had it made. He had it made, didn't he? He gave a prophecy nobody liked. Everybody was after him. The king wanted to kill him. But God said, go hide. But while he's hiding, God miraculously provided. I've never been fed by a bird. Well, unless it's fried. <laughs> or baked. <laughs> he had the water. He was cared for. How many of you have had times God has really abundantly blessed you? It seemed like he just poured it out and it just kept coming. Come on, how many of you have been there? How many of you enjoy those places? But how many of you have been in the places where the brook dried up and there is no more? And this is where Elijah is. And the brook dried up and the widow was scraping the bottom of the barrel. Literally, the bottom of the barrel with flour and with oil. These two negatives make room for God to be involved did you hear me today? These negatives made room for God to be involved. Is there anybody in the house today or watching by internet that are having situation, negative situations in your home, your health, your finances, somewhere in your life or around you, you have some negative things going on? Come on, raise your hand real high. Well, I want you to know this morning that those negatives are making room for God to be involved. I've never had a silver spoon in my mouth. Anybody else? How many of you can relate to that? But I know I am blessed. I am blessed and so are you. Sometimes it takes take scraping the bottom of the barrel so that we might trust in God's ability to provide. Only trust Him. Isn't that what song? Only trust Him now. And the way we learn to trust is by sometimes getting to the bottom of the barrel. I like it when the, there's plenty of money, don't you? I like it when the pantry's full. I like it when I can drive a newer car. And I'm really thankful we can put gas in the car. <laughs> Amen? See, you and I need what is called ever-increasing faith. How many of you like to have ever-increasing faith? How many of you want your faith to grow, become stronger in, in your confidence in God and His ability? Ever-increasing faith. You see, faith that grows is faith that is tested again and again and again. Faith that is tested. Have you ever said, Lord, I've had enough testing? Have you ever felt like you failed the test? Have you ever known you failed the test? How many of you know 
You can also look back and see when you passed it. And you've kept your faith and you kept your confidence in Him. My faith that grows is faith that is tested again and again and again. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Let me put you in there. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Our lack makes room for God's abundance. These verses lay out a path to abundance, to a supply, to a place of God's supply. He says here that He wants us to get to a place that we lack nothing that we need. Not just spiritual, materially, financially. God wants to bless you and God wants to bless me and He wants to bring us to a place that we'll have everything we need. Have you ever had a great need and it just looked like it wasn't going to be met? And your check wasn't big enough and there was no check in the mail as of yet? Or maybe the groceries were gone, the cupboard was bare, and you were beginning to wonder, God, what am I going to do to feed my family? And right at the moment when you needed the next meal, or right at the time when you needed to pay that bill, all of a sudden somebody knocked on the door or brought a box of groceries and came and met your need. God always moves on time. He's never late. He's never early. He's always on time because He cares for you. He cares for me. Hallelujah. The second thing is faith speaks, faith obeys, and faith receives. Faith speaks, faith obeys, and faith receives. I've had plenty of testing of my faith. I've had some lately. Anyone else? Amen? Raise your hand if you had any testing of your faith recently. See, but see God's wanting you to grow stronger. Perseverance, maturity, strength. He's developing that in your life through whatever it is you're going through. In the Old Testament, the people were taught to take care of the widows. Make sure they're provided for in the Old Testament. And though that's true, during the time of drought and during the time of famine, it was the widows, widows who would run out of food first. It was them. So here we are with our story. And it doesn't make sense. See, for God to say to Elijah in verse 9, Go at once to Zarephath, for I have commanded a widow there to supply you with food. For him to say that made no sense. The brook dried up. I guess the raven doesn't say it, but I guess the ravens quit coming as well. And now he's going to a place where there's no food. Have you ever had God speak something to you or that made no sense? Have you ever had the Lord speak to you about going to see somebody or stopping by somebody's house? And you were fearful and said, God, this don't make any sense. They won't receive me. They won't let me in. But when you obeyed, God moved, God worked, and He used you. The brook dried up. Ravens were no longer bringing food to Elijah. He was sent to a wid widow who was getting ready to fix her last meal for her son and herself. Elijah had nothing. The widow had practically nothing. How do you make something out of nothing? I can't do it. Can you? We as men and women, we, if we're going to make something, we have to have something to make it from. How do you make something out of nothing? Elijah's leaving a place where there's nothing, going to a place where there's nothing. How many of you like for God just to send you where there's nothing? Put you in a situation where there's no food, there's no provision, there's no way of taking care of yourself in the natural. My... He had nothing. Oh, but I know a man who can. I tell you, Jesus can take nothing and make something. Jesus can provide when there's no other way. He will provide when there is no other way. My wife and I more than once in our years of serving the Lord have been at the place where our cupboard was bare and our money had run out and somebody would knock on the door and there'd be a box of groceries. Or somebody would knock on the door and bring a check and we'd go pay our bills. I know a man who can. 
I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what the struggle is in your life. I don't know what it is you're battling with. But I know a man who can meet your need. I know a man named Jesus Christ who has it all under control. As Elijah came to town, he saw a widow gathering sticks to build a fire. You know, sometimes if you look at the surroundings, you can easily pray, God, how about let me go somewhere else? Amen? Lord, how about let me take another trip? How about put me in another city? How about move me to another job? How about put me in another church? God, there's too much faith required here. Amen? His first words to her, would you bring me a little water to drink? That doesn't sound like much of a request. But when the brook had dried up and there's a famine and you ask somebody to give you water, when water is scarce, it took faith for that woman just to go get him a cup of water. Are you with me this morning? Would you bring me a little water to drink? And I love verse 11, and it says, As she was going. <laughs> there was drought and famine, water was scarce, but the woman, watch this woman's actions reveal steps of faith. As she was going. Don't put off until tomorrow what God is speaking to you for today. Anybody need to hear that over here? Don't put off until tomorrow what God is speaking to you for today. Because if He's speaking to you for today and we put it off till tomorrow, we may, we may miss the blessing. We may miss the provision. Come on, am I making sense this morning? As she was going, she's going to get water. Water is scarce. She's going to get a, a valuable commodity. And she knows she only has a little water. There's very little water because of the famine. And while she's going to get the water, then he, he, he speaks to her and says, By the way, while you're getting the water, would you just make, bring me a piece of bread? So she's going to get water that's scarce. She don't even have any bread made yet. She knows she has enough just for she and her son. And he says, give me something to eat. I don't have any bread, she said, verse 12. But I like what she said, as surely as the Lord your God lives. I want to ask you, do people around you know that your God is alive? Do they know that Jesus lives in you? Do they know that He's alive and well in your household? Do they know, he, they know He's alive and well today? She said, as the Lord lives, Lord your God lives. I don't have any bread, a handful of oil. I'm getting ready to cook my last meal for my son and myself. We're going to eat and we're going to die. Sounds like she'd already dealt with all the feelings and emotions that come with dying. There's no other way out. There's no hope for us. There's no food line down the road and no Walmart. There's nothing. She'd already reconciled in her mind, we are going to die. How many of you know, God knows how to come when you need Him. The widow lived in an area where the people worshipped Baal, the false god. Yet she said, as the Lord your God lives. It's very important that that sinks in this morning. As your God lives, Elijah was hiding by the brook because the king and the people blamed him for the famine and he spoke, there will be no rain. Now I want you to get this. Baal worshippers believe that Baal was a fertility god who gives rain to make crops grow. So for this woman... To say to Joshua, I mean to Elijah, as surely as the Lord your God lives. I'll tell you, that's a big thing. See, her God has already been proven to be a liar. See, there was no rain. Crops were not growing. The fields had no grain for wheat to make the flour. No rain for olive trees so they could retrieve the oil for cooking. Baal could not provide flour and oil. But I know a man... Who can? Baal couldn't do it. See, God was really preparing Elijah for his, his uh, encounter 
with the prophets of Baal, remember? God was preparing him. The widow recognized Elijah as an Israelite. She also said, I know the Lord your God is alive. Here's a Gentile woman who lived in an area where they worshiped Baal who believed in the Lord. Don't tell me that God can't reach in the slums and in the crack houses and the places where there's such poverty where people barely exist. Don't tell me that God can't show up there, send a person that can go in there and begin to turn things around. Now it's real important that we realize that what's happening here in Luke chapter 4 and verse 25. Luke 4 and 25, I assure you, this is Jesus talking, I assure you there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. Did you get that? He wasn't sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. God says, listen, Jesus said there was a famine. Elijah prophesied it and it happened. But God says, I did not send Elijah, I did not send provision to any of the widows of Israel. Israel had so disobeyed God that God was sick of it. Instead of sending help to Israel, he sent help to a woman who would listen to Elijah and believe the Lord and know that he's alive and well and he met her need instead. God can choose whoever He wants to choose to bless. I don't care how dark the place, how hard the place is, wherever the person is, that son, that daughter, that relative, that friend, may be in one of the darkest places in their lives, but God knows how to send somebody right to where they are, speak the right word that turns everything around for them. If you have children, grandchildren, loved ones, family or friends that are bound in the power of the enemy, they are full of darkness because of sin or whatever, in the name of Jesus, you have to realize today that God knows how to send the light in there, turn the light on and expose his power and set them free. Yeah, go ahead and give him a hand. Thank you for it today. Thank you for it. Elijah asked her to fix some bread. Fix her last cake of bread. Have you ever had people come by at supper time? They used to do it a lot, didn't they? Dear Lord, we just sat down to eat and here comes four or five more. God, what am I going to feed them? How many of you remember some times like that? How many of ladies, how many of you remember the times God stretched the food? Dear Lord, how am I going to feed all these kids? Come by my house and you'll be asking that question a lot. How are we going to feed all these grandkids? My wife told me the grandkids came over yesterday while I was studying and they all got a sausage on a stick with pancake. You seen those? And before they left, Ethan said, I'm getting up early tomorrow morning. And I'm coming back over here for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> and they show up pretty often. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Have you ever considered that you need to put God's will first in your life? Have you ever considered that? Because once you consider it and make that decision, you're going to be challenged with it. Don't you need to consider to put God's will first in your life above everything else? Don't you know He has a better plan for you than you have for yourself? Don't you know He knows what He's doing in your life? My. See, He already knew her plan. See, Elijah knew her plan. She and her son were planted, uh, were, was at the bottom of the barrel literally. They were planning to die. Give me some bread first. Now immediately after he spoke his request for bread, he spoke the promise of God. He said, here's what I need from you. And then he said, don't be afraid. No income, no food, no hope. How can you help not be afraid? He said, don't be afraid. And then in verse 14, he he spoke to her. I want to go back there. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. How about you know we need to pay attention to what God says? The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. So she's on the way to make the bread. 
her last cake of bread. And he tells, gives her a promise from God. Elijah spoke the promise by faith. You and I have to speak to our mountains and we have to speak to the situations by faith. Doesn't matter whether they, anything's changed or not. What matters is if you're changing, if I'm changing, if we're learning to put our trust and confidence in God. Have you ever tried to fix some things you shouldn't have tried to fix? I've had to throw away a few things I thought I could repair. How many of you glad God doesn't throw us away? There's another song I like that says, Let Jesus fix it for you. The widow, Elijah obeyed by faith. The widow obeyed by faith. Faith speaks and faith obeys. How near is, your, how near is faith to you right now? How near is faith to you? How close are you to speaking the word of faith that will begin to turn everything around for you? How close could you possibly be to that word of faith? Well, I'm going to tell you how close. Are you ready? Are you ready? Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. Thank you, Jesus. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. How close is the word? <laughs> are you receiving this word today? Anybody? Everybody that's awake, raise your hand. If you wish you were awake. No, don't raise your hand if you wish you were awake. <laughs> are you getting it in your thoughts today? Are you getting the word that we're preaching today in your heart? The word of God is so close. The Word of God is so close to you and the circumstances you face and the impossible situations that you deal with. The Word of God is so close. The Word of faith is so close that all you have to do is speak it. Why don't you join Dwayne Modlin with me this morning? The devil is a liar. So we need to speak that devil, you're a liar and the father of all lies. All that's in you is deceit and I refuse to listen to you today. The Bible says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. The Bible teaches that we overcome by our faith in him. All things are possible to him that believeth. How close is the word of God? You've been hearing it today. It's in your mind. Are you getting it in your heart? If you're hearing it, it's getting in your mind and in your heart and your spirit. Guess what? All you have to do now is speak it. If you've got a mountain, raise your hand. How many of you have a mountain that you're facing, a difficult situation? You need God to give you some wisdom, direction. You need God to answer a prayer. You need God to move it out of the way. You need God to give you the strength to go through. You just need help from God. Put it back up there again. Hey Amen. You know what it is? Before you leave this place, you need to speak to that mountain in the name of Jesus and say, by the authority of Jesus' name, as a child of God, I speak to this thing and I command it to go. Amen. How near is the word of faith? So close you can speak it. You know what she did? the widow went away and did what the prophet had told her. See, her, ob her, her obedient response demonstrated her faith in the word of the Lord. When we hear a word from God and we hear a message like this today, we need to have an immediate response. We don't need to wait until the devil pulls all this out of our mind and our heart. We need to have an immediate response to the word of God. If God is speaking to you today, then there needs to be an immediate response to what He is saying. Hallelujah. How many of you know God really is faithful? And you can trust Him. You can trust Him. Faith speaks and faith obeys. Now, 1 Kings 17, 15, 16. I know I've already read it, but I want to read it again. Amen. I want to read it again real quickly today. She went away and did as the, He told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. The jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. In keeping with the word of the Lord. In keeping with the promise of God. You can trust the promise of God. You can depend on the promise of God. You can have faith in the promise of God. Faith speaks, faith obeys, and faith receives. The abundant supply was in keeping with the word of the Lord. Number three, 
Jesus is the yes to all of God's promises. Say it with me. Jesus is the yes to all of God's promises. Dear Lord, the widow said, As the Lord your God lives, as the Lord word, as the Lord your God lives. Second Corinthians 1 and 20 in the King James. For all the promises in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. In other words, all the promises of God are what? Yes and amen. I like verse 20 in the NIV. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Jesus or in Christ and throw through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Anybody feel like shouting on that verse today? Hallelujah. Doesn't matter how many the promises are. They're yes in Christ. They're yes. See, Jesus is the yes and the amen to every promise in the Bible. Doesn't matter what it is. The amen, the amen is spoken by us. You know what amen means? Agree. It's done. Does anybody agree? Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Our part is to believe the promises of God. Our part is to speak the promise that we know. It does not matter how many negatives there are in your life. These negatives make room for God to be involved. I need Him to be involved in some things, don't you? Matter of fact, I need Him involved in everything that has to do with me. The negatives are opportunities for God to be God in your life. Be God in my life. Our lack makes room for God's abundance. Faith speaks, faith obeys, faith receives from Him. Jesus is the yes to all the promises. Jesus is the yes. Just say a great big yes. Yes. When we stand on His word in faith, you know what Jesus says? Yes. He is the yes. He is the yes to your situation. He is the yes to your pain. He is the yes to your suffering. He is the yes concerning that job. When the brook dried up, or when it dries up, guess what? God has another plan. God has another plan. How near is the word of faith? You've heard the word of faith today. How near is it to you? It's near you, the scripture says. It's even in your heart and in your mouth. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Put faith to work. Is anybody getting it besides me? Put faith to work because God cares. God cares. Will you stand? Thank you, Lord. I can't take a heart that's broken and make it over again. But I know a man who can. <laughs> I can't take a soul that's sin sick and wash it white as snow. But I know a man who can. I can't walk upon the water and calm a raging sea. But I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you think that no one loves you, and your life is out of hand, and you may be here in this service today, or watching by internet, and that's how you feel. Or maybe in the future when you watch this DVD. But I know a man who can. Father, I want to thank you today because of your faithfulness. <laughs> I want to thank you for your wonderful word that's full of power and of life and of hope. Lord, I want to thank you that you love us more than we can even, we even realize. And you work for us in so many ways and we don't even recognize it, God. Lord, you do love me and I know it. Not, I know it because the Bible tells me, but I know it because I know you. 
God, I thank you that the negatives are just simply making room for you to work. Only you can take nothing and make something. God, I ask you to do it today. Romans 10, 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith which we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. All the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Father, I want to thank you today with the words of our mouth, God, believing that you're Son of God, Savior, and Lord, and with asking you to come in to forgive us, Lord, you change our lives. And then today, God, speaking what the Word says. God, we thank you for that today. We know a man who can. Who can. While your heads are bowed today, if you're here today and you, by internet or in the service, you say, Pastor Bracken. <laughs> I heard what you read about believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. I've never done that. And today I'd like to receive Christ. I'd like to know Him. I'd like to become a follower of Jesus. And I'd like to do it right now. And the Lord is ready. And here's what you need to do. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Come into your heart and be your Lord. Confess that He's Jesus, Son of God, buried, risen again, and alive. And He did it for you. If you'll pray those, that prayer and ask God now, He'll forgive and set you free. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do as we close. A lot of hands went up saying, I've got some negative things I'm dealing with. We said we need to, we need to, we need to address it now. Raise your hand again. Everybody has some kind of negative thing you're dealing with in your life or around you. Right where you stand. In the name of Jesus, will you just begin to speak out to God and say, God, and take a promise of God that He will supply it. Are you ready? You know where it is right now. Why don't you speak it to Him? You don't have to speak it to me. Speak it to Him. All over this house, you can be loud, you can be quiet, it doesn't matter, but take it to God right now. Jesus, I bring it to you. Lord, you see that situation. God, you see that situation with finances. You see that situation with health issues. Lord, you see the situation with a son or a daughter that's in drugs or in alcohol. God, you see the situation where a family member is in immorality. God, you see a situation where there's a need for a better job. God, you see every situation everybody's speaking of today as their hands are raised. And right now, God, we bring it to you. God, we speak it to you now. God, we declare it now. We speak it because the word is so near. All we have to do is speak it, but we speak it in faith, knowing that you hear us and knowing that you're working and knowing that you're working, knowing that you're working. In the name of Jesus, thank you for your answer. Thank you for your answer.